A Baker's Dozen at the Zetland Hotel by Ian Gordon Chapter 13 The Unexpected Brownie, a.k.a. the Shadow Man, having shown his latest and final guest to Room 12, returned to the reception area and went about making his concluding preparations. Generic duties seen to, those everyday tasks befitting a would-be desk clerk, he perused the stack of envelopes pushed to one side, checking each one and its contents scrupulously. Brownie was ill-equipped to ponder, and so, paying no mind to Mr. Turner as he passed through the entrance hall, a look of silent wonder stamped across his tired face, the hotelier simply stared into space, listening to the heavy ticking of the clockmaker's dial on the wall behind him. The time was nigh. At exactly 12.02 p.m., the shadow man knocked at the door belonging to room two. A dog barked, followed by a series of footsteps. Emma Norling, her faithful companion Amadeus by her side, pulled open the door. Her bright eyes met Brownie's, but no words were exchanged. The plain-faced man gestured for her to follow him as he continued to room three. It was coming up to 12.03 when Brownie tapped at Mr. Burroughs' door. The grinning seventy-two-year-old appeared at the threshold a few short moments later, greeting both the hotelier and, in turn, Emma, who had strolled up beside him. Again, the man in the brown suit said nothing at all, merely signalled for John to join him. Just as the pleasant twenty-something had done, the elderly man left his room and followed Brownie and the young lady across the entrance hall. The shadow man passed the door to room four, and stopped outside room five. A gentle tap-tap-tap-tap-tap, and Elaine Olson was soon standing before the small party, more than willing to join them. Then Brownie was at the door to room six, summoning Pip Farmington. Pip looked a little worse for wear when he answered the call, but, like the others, intrigued by the tranquil formality of it all, joined the group, and off they went in the direction of the stairs. By 12.07, the ocean lover, Mark Patterson, had been roused from a comfortable snooze, and was in the act of joining the other guests as they moved towards room eight. 12.08, and Mary Henderson was up and about, nodding and smirking, more than a little curious with regards to the nature of the midnight jaunt. Like room four, room nine was by past two, the small company heedless of the royal suite's vault-like door as they approached room ten, across the landing. Annabel Marsh heard the knocking just after twelve-ten, and answered the call with fervour. Her vision in the bathtub had prepared her for the mysterious hotelier's coming, though the purpose of his call was still unknown to her. She looked at the others standing alongside him, did some of those faces belong to the name she'd seen on the boats in the boneyard? The hotelier signalled for her to join them, and she did without hesitation. 12.11 saw the addition of Maurice Turner to the party, the man in the round glasses who to the rest of the guests gathered there in the corridor looked as though he'd seen a ghost. 12.12, a Newton Lyman was stirred from an accidental nap a look of genuine surprise on his coarse face as he opened the door to room twelve. Still, in spite of the rude awakening, the occult expert was more than happy to join the small party. Hadn't he dreamt of Brownie's coming? At last, the guests were gathered, and the procession could commence. Silently, Brownie led the guests, nine of them in all, towards the landing. Somehow, each of them knew where they were being guided, and when the would-be hotelier stopped with his back to room thirteen, they automatically mustered round him, forming a circle. Ladies and gentlemen, Brownie began, his tone as always monotonous. I bring tidings. Reaching into an inside pocket, he withdrew nine envelopes. Emma Norling, he announced 
and handed the topmost envelope to the young lady who was seeing to her aunt in Gisborough. Amadeus, it has to be said, uttered not even a whimper as the exchange took place. John Burroughs, he said, handing the second envelope to the seventy-two-year-old who had bidden farewell to the old steelworks. Elaine Olson, Brownie continued, and passed the third envelope to the elderly lady who had clutched the memory-maker in order to feast upon visions of yesteryear. Philip Farmington was the next to be called, the man who had looked guilt in the face as it burned with loathing in the library fireplace. Mark Patterson, said the hotelier, passing the fifth envelope to the guest with the gambling problem, the man who had caught a glimpse of the evening's proceedings. Mary Henderson, came the monotonous tones again, as the lady who had been held up shopping came forth to claim her letter. Annabel Marsh, Brownie called, handing the seventh letter to she who had visited the boneyard, a woman whose exceptional sensitivity had taken her closer to strangeness than any in the company of the shadow man had ever been before. Maurice Turner, sounded the hotelier, this time nodding slightly as he passed the eighth envelope to the man who encountered the putty girl in the billiard room. Newton Lyman was the last to be called, and the occult expert tiptoed forward like a frightened animal, accepting his envelope with a touch of reluctance. These tidings are of the utmost importance, Brownie declared, his face barely discernible now, for you have a decision to make. Some of you, I believe, have already made it. Several heads nodded. To those of you who have done so, I invite you to open your letter. Four of the nine guests proceeded to open their envelopes. John, Elaine, Pip, and Maurice. John, Brownie invited. It says, Permission granted. Elaine, Pip, Maurice, the shadow man prompted. Permission granted, said Pip, who was quickly echoed by Elaine. Then, after some deliberation, Maurice. I invite the four of you to step into room thirteen. Our special guest is ready to see you now. The spirit photographer, Maurice Turner, broke into a sweat as the man in the brown suit turned to face the vault-like door and began to dial its massive five-spoke handle. The outline of the hotelier's figure, twisted in the act of spinning the vast wheel, was precisely the image Maurice had captured on film just a few hours prior. What? What's on the other side? Maurice asked nervously, trembling like a child on the verge of tears. In your case, sounded Brownie's inimitable tones, the answer to a great question. Maurice dabbed at the beads of sweat peppering his brow. I... I don't think... I don't think I can. Don't fret, Mr. Turner, the hotelier reassured. There's nothing to be afraid of. A mighty clatter sounded, and just like that, the door to the royal suite was unlocked. The shadow man pushed the heavy door forwards, and it swung open, revealing a dark space beyond. Light from the landing seemed to terminate at the threshold, masking the contents of the mysterious suite entirely. "'You may proceed,' the blank-faced man encouraged, addressing the four individuals to whom permission to enter had allegedly been granted. "'Who? Who's in there?' Maurice ventured, his voice wavering. "'A friend,' Brownie asserted. "'A guide, if you will.' John, Elaine, and Pip strolled headlong into the darkness. Elaine especially wasn't at all afraid. The vault-like door possessed the same surface characteristics that had belonged to her short-lived sphere. She would put all of her unanswered questions to the special guest on the other side. But Maurice hesitated. Fear not, Mr. Turner, Brownie comforted. Your time has come. Panic consumed the spirit photographer. His mind was awash with the strange things he'd witnessed earlier that evening, awash with the strange practices he'd subjected himself to, 
over the long years. Now that he was within arm's reach of the answers he sought, he found himself paralyzed. I don't... I don't want to. It's far too late for that, Mr. Turner, came the hollow tones of the shadow man, and as Maurice felt the import of those words, he caught sight of a figure along the neighboring corridor, a small, childlike figure wreathed in shadow, a very familiar figure. I'll grant you a wish, it had said, and he'd asked for that wish, it had granted that wish, and through this shadowy portal was the fulfillment of that wish. He couldn't walk away now, he wouldn't be permitted to walk away. Those were the terms of the deal. The spirit photographer swallowed audibly, then took a tentative step towards the murky aperture. He shuffled towards it, his senses overwrought, but still nothing met his gaze beyond the threshold. There were no sounds to hear, no scents to smell, nothing in the air to taste. All that remained was the elementary sense of touch, his heavy feet making contact with the carpeted floor as he ambled step by step towards the mouth of the monster. Brownie watched as the fifty-two-year-old crossed the threshold, listened to the final erratic beats of the man's heart as he vanished into the realm beyond. Four of them had entered room thirteen. Four of them were now at the mercy of the Zetland's most illustrious guest. But the shadow man was ill-equipped to ponder, and so he plainly observed, as the gigantic, vault-like door was closed from within, by hidden hands. He turned his attention once more to the remaining guests, Emma Norling and her dog Amadeus, Mark Patterson, Mary Henderson, Annabel Marsh, and Newton Lyman. As for the rest of you, he began, pointing towards the letters in their hands, mark my words, these tidings are of the utmost importance, adhere to the words printed therein, or I will be obliged to return. Only Mark Patterson, a gambling man, would have ventured the following question. And I am guessing that would be a bad thing? Mr. Patterson, Brownie replied, my return would involve the premature opening of this door. The sausage dog, Amadeus, let out the tiniest of whimpers, whilst Mark, blushing, took a step back, sensing that he'd overstepped his mark. And so followed the shadow man's closing words. Please, return to your rooms. Like automata, the five remaining guests did exactly that. In the privacy of their suites, they each studied their handwritten letters. In room two, Emma Norling was befuddled by a blank piece of paper. Had she been a witness and nothing more? Not even Amadeus could illuminate her in this respect. In room seven, Mark Patterson was cautioned concerning the nature of his addictive personality. A destructive force, it was. The key to redemption, attenuation. In room eight, Mary Henderson was reminded of the true value of simple human interaction. The material world would ruin not only her, but the lives of her children, too. In room ten, Annabel Marsh finally understood the implications of her visit to the boneyard, the tired boats and the illegible names. The lives of human beings are much the same. Through the passage of time, we grow feeble and decrepit. With the decline of our minds follows the end of our days. Our faces and names are eventually forgotten, washed up on the silent sands of some halfway place. In room twelve, the occult expert, Newton Lyman, was told of the error of his ways, the futility of his purpose, mortal man vainly pursuing elaborate ideas above his station. He was instructed to enjoy the life he'd been given, to taste of humble pleasures. But there was a shared notion that each of the remaining guests just couldn't help but consider. What gave this unremarkable character in the brown suit and tidy brogues, the right to pass judgment over them. Who was he, and where did he come from? 
Perhaps the answers to such questions would be provided by the very thing that they each knew would greet them upon the inevitable crossing of that dark threshold. The Zetland's special guest, who to disturb would be to commit a great, great sin. The Shadow Man, having watched the remaining guests vacate the landing, headed in the direction of Room 9. Entering the quiet suite, he collected the painting now host to the merged renderings of Julia Carlyle and Lucille Sharples, and proceeded in the direction of the stairs. Joined by his short, rubbery associate, the putty girl, he ascended to the second floor, and roamed the halls in quest of a certain passage, leading to a certain space beneath a vaulted ceiling. Hanging the painting, Brownie looked down at the curious creature standing at his side. It is done, came the queer voice of the putty girl, in response to the unspoken needs of the man in the brown suit. The shadow man grinned. The cycle continues, he muttered. Then, patting the imitation of a child on its bobbing head, we're as stars. Brightly we shine. Too soon do we dwindle. And with those parting words, the man in the brown suit inexplicably vanished, tumbled down the years to be judge, jury, and executioner in a Victorian Britain. The putty girl, on the other hand, returned to the ether, set to rain down as per her master's command. Thanks for joining us for our fifth 12 Days of Christmas special, ladies and gents. Over 13 days in this case. If you enjoyed it, be sure to check out our very first special, High Strangeness in the Village of Rillington, in which Brownie and his little counterpart make their first appearance. We'll pop a link in the video description below. In other news, Van Melson will be back at the end of the month, so be sure to watch this space. Until next time. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, Click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.